This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul. Shine when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Joyful, joyful. can be seated. It is the day the Lord's made, right?
Choir. Thank you for joining them. What a wonderful word to remind us that the name of the Lord is to be blessed. The context of that particular rendering is out of Job, where Job is encouraged to bless the name of the Lord through the working of the Spirit in his life because of the adversity that has come. And no matter what happens to you, good or bad, you and I together are to bless the name of the Lord because that name is a name that is above all names, and that name is what inspires us, empowers us, and encourages us to be God's people. And, and even as we have thought about, during the month of October, stewardship and responsibility and appropriate giving and doing what is right in the name of the Lord, we bless him, and he's with us to encourage us and inspire us to do even more. The Old Testament lesson this morning is the basis of the sermon today, which will conclude the series of four sermons that deal with the generosity of our sharing. The text is printed in the worship folder for you to follow along. It's from Exodus chapters 35 and 36, and the translation from which I'm reading is the New Revised Standard Version. Listen to these words from Exodus 35, 4 through 9, and then Exodus 36, 2 through 7. Moses said to all the congregation of the Israelites, This is the thing the Lord has commanded. Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Let whoever is of a generous heart bring the Lord's offering, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and crimson yard, and fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram's skin, and fine leather, leather, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod and the breastplate. Then all the congregation of the Israelites withdrew from the presence of Moses. And they came, everyone whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing, and brought the Lord's offering to be used for the tent of meeting, and for all its service, and for the sacred vestments. So they came, both men and women. All who were of a willing heart brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and pendants all sorts of gold objects, everyone bringing an offering of gold to the Lord. Now from Exodus 36. Moses called to Bezalel and Aholiab, and every skillful one to whom the Lord had given skill, everyone whose heart was stirred to come to do the work. And they received from Moses all the free will offerings that the Israelites had brought were doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning, so that all the artisans who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came 
each from the task being formed, performed, and said to Moses, The people are bringing much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave command, and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. For what they had already brought was more than enough to do all the work. This is the inspired word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. For the joy of being able to bless your name, we give thanks, O God. For the joy of being able to say, Blessed be your name, collectively, in one voice with the choir, we are so humbled. You are with us, O God, in the good moments and the bad moments. And the truth of the matter is, even in the midst of bad and adversity in this life, there is still goodness because you are good. And because you have made the day, we rejoice and we are glad in it no matter what. So we humbly pray that you would help us to consider the generosity of our sharing. I pray that you would help us to fix our sharing if we need to do that. I pray that you would overwhelm us to be more generous if we need to do that individually and collectively as one faith family. Father, I give thanks for the opportunity that you have bestowed upon me to challenge myself, but to challenge all of us to be more responsible when it comes to financial stewardship. So in these moments, I pray humbly as I seek to share a word from your word that prayerfully is inspired by you, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will truly be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And if by chance my words miss the mark, I pray Pentecost will occur again, so that the people who sit before me and before you will understand fully what the Word of God is saying. Through Jesus Christ, Amen. I have an announcement that I need to make. As pastor of Garden Lakes Baptist Church, I need to ask you to stop bringing tithes and offerings. You are giving far too much money. We have more money than we know what to do with. In fact, the safe can't even hold that money. In fact, we're not sure that the bank can hold all the money that you are bringing. That's an incredible announcement, isn't it? It is just astonishing, and I didn't mean a single word of it. Don't have a stroke. Don't believe what the preacher just said, because that statement does not apply to Garden Lakes Baptist Church. I know that some of you wish it did apply to Garden Lakes Baptist Church, but at this particular moment in time, Sunday, October the 29th in the year of our Lord, 2017, that does not apply. Now, I do have another word that I want to say, an announcement to make. As a pastor of Garden Lakes Baptist Church, I want to encourage those of you who are giving to continue to give and give in abundance and give faithfully and give joyfully. And to those of you who are not giving, you need to start giving. It's an incredible invitation, isn't it? That announcement does apply to Garden Lakes Baptist Church. Isn't this an incredible story out of the book of Exodus? The context is such that the people of God are in the wilderness, and God has instructed Moses to say to the people that we need to build 
the tabernacle or the tent of meeting or the sanctuary as it might be called. It's not the temple yet because they haven't established Jerusalem as the place to worship. But Moses calls the people to give out of their possessions so that they can make a tent of meeting, a tabernacle, a place where the people of God can worship. And after he issues that call, the people, one after another, bring stuff. They didn't have dollar bills and dimes like I had a few moments ago with the children and like many of you have in your purses and wallets right now. But the people brought what they had. They brought gold, they brought silver, earrings, necklaces, all kinds of things that could be used to make the tabernacle and to make it rather nice. They brought and brought and brought. In fact, they brought so much that Moses had to say, y'all are bringing too much. Just stop bringing for a while. What an incredible announcement. Is this one of those stories in the Bible that we just read and think, well, that was then, but this is now, and I'm not really sure that that could happen now. Is this one of those obscure texts of Scripture where we just kind of glib over it and say, well, wasn't that nice? And not try to make any kind of application to us today? I think that this word is a reminder of our call by the generosity of our sharing to examine where we are with regard to financial stewardship. And it's a reminder to us that, that we are to give and give and give. This fascinating story reminds us that the people of God in the desert, in the wilderness, gave and gave. In fact, they gave abundantly, so much so that there was too much of an, of an abundance. In fact, they were giving more and more and more, and Moses was saying, I appreciate your more and more and more, but the more and more and more is too much. So stop for a while. Don't get any ideas. Because we're not challenged by God to stop giving yet. And I have a hunch until Jesus comes back that we're not going to stop giving because we're giving so much. If there's any word that ought to characterize our lives, if there's any word that ought to characterize the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, if there's anything that ought to characterize how we go about business with God, it is that we can never give God enough. We can never give God enough of our possessions. We can never give God enough of our money. We can never give God enough of our time, of our energy. We can never give God enough of anything. God has given us so much that there's no way in this world that we could ever possibly repay Him, not that He's expecting us to repay Him. But an offering is a vital part of worship, as I was trying to communicate with the children this morning. Giving and offering symbolizes that we appreciate what God has done. And it's a reminder to us that Jesus had a whole lot to say about money, wealth, possessions, things that define us, and, and whether we like it or not, sisters and brothers, our, our money, our wealth, our possessions our time, our energy, those things define us. And the reality is, I guess maybe an irony, is that those things really aren't our things anyway. Because our money, our wealth, our possessions, our energy, our time, all of it belongs to God. That's right. Everything belongs to God. Our time, our energy, our gifts, whatever, they are the Lord's. And because they're the Lord's, we remember that Jesus wants us to be responsible. Not that money is everything. And I know many times Baptists get tired of hearing the preacher talk about money. And to be honest with you, I'm somewhat embarrassed at times to even have to talk about money simply because I shouldn't have to talk about money as a pastor. No pastor should. It just should come naturally. But, but for whatever reason, the evil one has gotten a hold of us, all of us, 
And the evil one has said, well, you know, it's just really not necessary to give one of these $10 bills back to the Lord. In fact, just go ahead and keep it. And we rationalize in our minds that, yeah, that's okay, we, we, we can do that. We rationalize that, well, somebody else will give. And the point that I want to make with us with regard to what Jesus had to say, especially in Luke's gospel, is that, no, life is not just about money. Church is not just about money, but money is a part of discipleship. Because it's not just what you do by taking the one and putting it in the offering plate, and let's just say taking another one here and saving it and leaving you with eight. It's what you do with the other eight. Because the other eight needs to be used in ways that exemplify responsible discipleship with regard to the relationship to Jesus Christ. Interestingly, the people in the wilderness seem to have gotten that. They seem to have understood that. It amazes me how that these people, as they were in Egyptian slavery, experienced literally the coming of God into their lives and God fighting for them when Pharaoh said, get out of here, go, get away from me. And they find themselves against the sea and God parts that sea and literally he's fighting for his people and they cross on dry land and the Egyptians are defeated and Moses leads them in the wilderness. It's true that they complain, that they rebel, they're disobedient, but God still provides for them by giving them manna in the morning and quail in the evening. He's there with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. His presence is obvious, yet they continue to rebel. They continue to, to disobey. They continue to, to be focused on themselves, but God still cares. Moses goes up on the mountain at Sinai to commune with God, and he's up there for a good while. After a while, he comes down with those ten words on tablets that we've come to call the Ten Commandments. And the people, as they're waiting for Moses, figure, well, Moses, something's happened to him. We, we don't know where he is. We don't know where this God of his is. Figuring that Moses and Yahweh are out of the picture before Moses comes down, they talk Aaron, the second man in charge, into allowing for a golden calf to be made, an idol that they could worship. And we know that God destroys that idol. Moses destroys it in a fit of rage and anger. The people are disobedient. They rebel. But God is still there providing for them. And the way this text reads, even in the midst of their rebellion, even in the midst of their disobeying, even in the midst of their selfishness, focusing on themselves, here... In these passages that I read from Exodus 35 and 36, we see a people who recognize who God is. And because they know what God has done for them and is doing for them and figuring what he will do for them, they commit themselves to giving and giving and giving and giving. They just give to the point that Moses says, enough, you are giving too much. I've challenged us as a congregation to join together in this place next Lord's Day, November the 5th, on what I've dubbed In Gathering Sunday, taken from the ancient Old Testament festival of booths or tabernacles or ingathering as it's called in some traditions. I've asked us to do three things, not pick one or two of the three, but to do three specific things. I've asked us first of all to show up and be here at 11 o'clock next Sunday morning. It wouldn't hurt to be here at 945 for a small group Bible study as well if you're not part of that, so I invite you to do that too. I've asked us to give sacrificial offerings next Lord's Day. I've asked us all to tithe. And, and if you do not tithe, that is, if you do not give 10% of your weekly gross income without any strings attached to the work of God at Garden Lakes Baptist Church, I'm asking you to do that next Sunday. 
If you do tithe, give 10%, I'm asking you to increase that by 50% so that if you give 10%, next Sunday you'll give 15%. Or if you give 12%, next Sunday you'll give 18%. The third thing that I'm asking us to do is to fill out the commitment card for the 2018 ministry budget. Your financial commitment and my financial commitment to the ministry of God here at Garden Lakes Baptist Church and to bring that and present it as an act of worship next Lord's Day. Nobody's going to see your card. Nobody will know what's on it except the Lord, you, and our financial administrative assistant, Brenda Trapp. I've challenged us to pledge the budget for next year. And I believe we will do that as God's people. I'm asking us to do those three things. Be here, tithe, or increase the tithe next Lord's Day morning. It's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. And the challenge that I'm putting before us is to be a people of sacrifice because that's what we see going on right here in this text of Scripture out of Exodus. Those people were giving and giving and giving. It's like one of the children said, just give it all. That seems to be what they were doing in Exodus, giving it all to the glory of God so his tent could be built. Next Sunday, I think, is going to be a great day at Garden Lakes Baptist Church. Not only is it in Gathering Sunday from the pastor's perspective and your perspective, hopefully, but on the Christian calendar, it's All Saints Sunday. And next Sunday, we'll call the names of those dearly beloved members of Garden Lakes Baptist Church who are now resting from their labors in paradise, who went to be with the Lord since last All Saints Sunday, which was November the 6th of last year. We're also going to have communion next Lord's Day by intention. You're going to come forward, take a piece of bread and dip it in the chalice just as we did on Homecoming Sunday. Eat it in return. You're going to bring your commitment card and your offering. We're going to do this together as a family of God, as an expression of gratitude for what God has done for us. I think next Sunday is going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. And brothers and sisters, I hope you are thinking that as well. It will be an incredible day because we serve an incredible God. And sometimes I think that we forget how incredible our God is. He's so incredible that he takes a group of people in the desert and provides for them even though they're rebellious, even though they're disobedient, and even though they're selfish and focused on themselves, God still provides for them and loves them even though he gets agitated with them from time to time. I mean, he never gets agitated with us, though, does he? Mm. God does get agitated with his people. And God doesn't like being agitated with his people, but it's not God, sisters and brothers. We bring that on ourselves because of our rebellion and our selfishness. So next Lord's Day, we have an opportunity to say, blessed be your name in tangible kinds of ways. And when we do that in those tangible kinds of ways, we have the funding to do ministry here in this community and ministry all over this world. We have the funding to do ministry that's not even outlined in the ministry budget. We have the funding to bless the name of the Lord. So that's the incredible invitation that I extend to you and extend to myself with regard to next Lord's Day. I'm just asking you to do that one Sunday, but if by chance you're moved by the Spirit to do it the next 51 Sundays, hallelujah, thanks be to God, you go right ahead and give it all if you want to. Obviously, I'm being facetious with that, but I am saying to us that as a faith people, as a congregation that's discerned over the past year, attempting to figure out what we believe God is wanting us to do, and we're going to talk about that and present that this evening in the church conference and vote on it, it will take funds, it will take dollars to do that. And I'm not just talking about nickels and dimes. I'm talking about more than that. I'm talking about heartfelt commitment 
and devotion with regard to tangible expressions through our tithes and offerings. We have to be serious about this. We have to take it seriously. And, and I believe in my heart of hearts that you do take it seriously and you want to continue to take it seriously and that you want to move in the direction of being able to pull the dollar bill off so that you are giving a minimum of 10% at some point in your life. And it's like I've said and tried to continue to say and, and stress with all of us, if you can do it all at once, that's great, but if you need to take your time in getting there, that's appropriate too. It's not going to happen, though, unless you respond to the invitation to give and do like the Hebrews did, to come and give with willful hearts, with cheerfulness, as Paul says, with a belief that God will take care of you and that God will provide because you still have plenty after you let go of the 10%. We have to do it because of the radical nature of God wanting to do revival and renewal in each of our lives. We have to do that, sisters and brothers, if we want to experience His blessing. We need to be like our ancestor, Martin Luther, Saxon Roman Catholic monk, who on October 31st, 1517, 500 years ago, day after tomorrow, in the village of Wittenberg, Germany, walked down to the castle church and nailed on the door of that church 95 reasons why the church needed to be reformed. In those days, the church door was the community bulletin board. And there were all kinds of things that were posted on church doors. There'll be a party tonight at so-and-so's house. There'll be this going on. And Luther walked down there and he nailed up those 95 theses and his people who could read began to read all those reasons why the church needed to be reformed. All pandemonium broke loose. And thus began the Protestant Reformation. And four years later, in 1521, Luther was tried for heresy. And the church told him he needed to recant of all those things. And Luther said, I cannot recant because my conscience is held captive by the Word of God. I can do no other. Here I stand. Luther wanted to see the church reformed. He didn't want to see the church splinter. He wanted to see it reformed. But it splintered into Baptists and Episcopalians and Lutherans and Presbyterians and all kinds of Tyrians and every other kind of denominational entity that you can imagine. He wasn't expecting that, but that's how the reform came about. And ever since, October 31st, 1517, men and women have been going through reformation, a reformation of their hearts in which they've been drawn closer and closer to God. Sisters and brothers, a reformation took place in the wilderness as Moses called the people to give. And that reformation is evidence in the fact that they came and willingly and joyfully gave and gave and gave. And the same thing happened in Luther's day and beyond. People came and they gave of themselves, they gave of their time, they gave their money so the reformation could spread all over the world and people could get right with God. And that's the bottom line when it comes to this incredible invitation to start giving so that people's lives can be radically changed, including your life and my life. And I believe by the power of God, we can change and we can make a difference by the generosity of our share. I don't know if I'll ever be able to make that announcement or not, Garden Lakes, you're giving too much money. It's killing us. You need to stop giving. I'll probably never be able to make that announcement. But I will be able to make the announcement, give joyfully and willingly, and give with a heart that is reformed and revived by the living God. 
it's not an impossibility. It's incredible that Moses would say, stop, but it's not impossible. That would be determined by you and me. So what will it be? I hope that you will be reformed and that reformation will continue because it can because of God who provides and because of a God who by the generosity of his own giving through Christ enables you and me to give more and more and more and more. How about it? Let it be so. Today, Father, we remind ourselves that what's ours is really not ours, it's yours. Today, we remind ourselves that we are to give willingly, generously, so that others might experience what we've experienced in Christ our Lord. May we accept the incredible invitation to keep on giving or start giving. And as a result of that invitation, may our lives be richer and may lives all over this world be richer so that reformation, the reforming of hearts, of minds, can continue. As we sing this morning, may each of us make the commitment to responding to the incredible invitation. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Thank you, Gina, and thank you, Julie. Michael, would you come stand, please? I'm happy this morning to present Michael Owens. And Michael uh, has been visiting churches in the area in Rome for the past year or so. He came last Lord's Day when Lamar preached about mice and cheese and all that stuff there. And he comes this morning saying he wants to join Garden Lakes Baptist Church. And he comes by statement. Um, it's very rare that somebody joins the church when the preacher preaches on money. So I, I am most humbled and honored that the Holy Spirit moved in your life, Michael. Seriously, we welcome you. If you join with me in receiving Michael into the fellowship, would you let it be known by saying, Michael, we love you. Michael, we love you. And we look forward to getting to know you in the faith journey as you encourage us and as we encourage you. Michael's going to be standing here. I'll be standing with him this morning. You come by and greet him on your way out. Michael, if you just sit down for just a few moments. Our deacon chair, Kenneth Gibson, uh, needs to say something. He won't tell me what it is, and that always worries me, but... You all are so kind. You, you've been so gracious to Jackie and me, and I appreciate my beloved spouse, Jackie, who has affirmed me and supported me and, and affirms you in this congregation. But thank you for these cards, and thank you for your love and your affirmation. Michael, if you can stand here in just a moment, Alan's going to lead us in our unity song before, just after I pronounce the pastoral blessing. But, but I do, I want to remind you that at 4.15 this afternoon in Kenneth's small group Bible study room, uh, the spiritual discernment team will meet, spend time in prayer from 4.15 until about 5 o'clock. Our church conference is at 5 o'clock this evening in the fellowship hall. We'll be transacting the business that needs to be transacted, but the main item of business this evening will be the spiritual discernment team's recommendation. So you've had that, you have it. I hope you'll be here tonight as we talk about that and begin to put into motion 
those things that we believe God has called us to do and be here at Garden Lakes Baptist Church. Ready yourselves now to depart into this world that God loves in partnership with Him and with one another. And as you are going, know this for certain. Christ enlivens you as you persevere in following His way. Christ encourages you as you immerse yourself in learning His truth. And Christ empowers you as you devote yourself to live His life. Give thanks to God, your Heavenly Father, revealed most clearly and perfectly in His one and only unique Son, Jesus Christ, who through the Holy Spirit is with you always, constantly showing you the way, teaching you the truth, and giving you life. Amen and amen. Please stand, reach across the aisles, join your hands together as Alan leads us in this song, and come by and speak to Michael as you make your way out. Amen.